Welcome back to The Wandering Naturalist. Last time we talked about deer and how amazing they are, but how we need to really have a balance in their population. Because if we're going to manage for a species versus an individual, and if we're going to manage for our parks in general, we have to kind of clean up the mess we made with getting rid of their predators, with changing the habitat to one that encourages uh, rapid deer population growth. It really comes down to having a balance between taking care of the deer and taking care of the rest of our parks. And a balance between taking care of the deer we have now and taking care of the deer we want to have in the future. Absolutely. We have some really good guests to help shed more light on this balance and what that means for us as staff in the Park District. So Stephen Hogg is with us. He's a wildlife supervisor here at Three Rivers. And then also joining us to represent NRM, or Natural Resource Management, is Sean Howard, the nursery operations supervisor who works up at our nursery. So, Stephen, can you introduce yourself and a little bit about what you do here at the parks? Yeah, hello. Um, I can definitely introduce myself. Uh, to start with, I'd like to talk about my story. Um, so, I'm actually originally not from Minnesota. I'm originally from Alberta, Canada, um, and I grew up on a farm up there. And uh, it was from that time that uh, working on the farm that I saw my dad. We were out actually working on the, the fields and... It was a really wet year the year prior. And then the following year, um, it was a really dry year. And so he had me out there with a lighter, and I'm lighting up all these wetlands, and he's plowing through them, and that was a lot of fun. But then watching him go through those wetlands was a, definitely a, a memory that I have that stuck with me. And I'm not anti-farming, grew up on a farm. Uh, that's a whole other story in itself. But just watching that just resonated with me and made me want to work towards protecting wildlife and protecting wildlife places. Seeing the conversion of natural areas to processed areas, I guess man-made areas. Yeah. 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 So at the time I was watching the prote- like watching that happen and wanted to protect that. And then it was later on in my career that I realized you can recreate that. And so that was something in high school. I was like, oh, I want to definitely become a wildlife biologist. So I knew pretty early on that that's what I wanted to do. Um, so I ended up going to school in Alberta, finished a four-year degree in, in environmental and conservation biology, and then met a wonderful young lady who brought me to Minnesota. And so now uh, we live here, we're married, we have three kids. And when we moved here, I started with the park district very early on volunteering. And I volunteered 40 hours a week, and it just became this place that I fell in love with very quickly. And grew just a passion um, for working here. And it's just blossomed into an incredible career for me and currently work as, like you said, the, the wildlife supervisor. And uh, it's been a lot of fun protecting wildlife How long places. have you been so, at the park district now? Yeah, so I've been here for, it's been 13 years full time with my seasonal work, you know, 15 years. So it's been a while. It awesome. goes by quick. Yeah, I, it yeah. does. Yeah. I know you've been an amazing resource for me because anytime I have questions for you, you you email right away, you give me a call, you you always have the answers I'm looking for. So I appreciate oh, it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I didn't know you're Canadian. I, I guess I'm kind of curious. How come I have never heard you say a boot or a? Yeah. Oh, he does. Yeah, I do. <laughs> you do? I, okay. I maybe sometimes try to cover it up. Okay. Me, <laughs> I, I haven't noticed that yet. So When he's in his natural setting, maybe, because <laughs> you hear it all the time. Yeah. Trust me. That's right. Well, great. I'm w- looking forward to talking about deer population yeah, management, because I know you're heavily involved with that. And Sean, can you introduce yourself? Hi. Yes. Thank you. I came to Natural Resources a little bit later in life, in my early 30s, after a variety of different career paths, um, including... I played music in high school and got into AV, went to school, starting out for audio video and recording, um, which kind of turned into a career in IT, but I, um, it sort of wasn't for me. And I did, um, my dad is a general contractor. He does restoration, old home. So I kind of got into that and that experience helped me get, and I realized in my 30s that I really wanted to work in natural resources and work at the parks. Um, and I was able to get a job in maintenance because of my remodeling and construction background. And through that, um, I had an interest in forestry, became a certified arborist, um, and just sort of on my own studied and got to know people in the forestry department, uh, became a forestry technician, an arborist in forestry, and then... Um, you went back to maintenance for a little bit. Went and back then... to maintenance, right, as a, as a crew chief, uh, which gave me a lot of good uh, leadership experience. And then... Um, when the forestry manager retired, they restructured and created a nursery supervisor, and I was thrilled to be able to mm-hmm. take that position and go back into natural resources, where I've been now for a couple of years. So, Yeah, I remember my first time meeting you was during, as a seasonal, we were doing a burn somewhere, and you got to participate in the burn. So it's, you've always had an interest yes. there to, to get in natural resources. So it goes to show you two different paths, right? but you can still always still get there to the natural resource world. Yeah. I mean, growing up, I really didn't know there were so many different career options. I didn't know there were options to work 
in natural resources like this until I was older and, uh, you know, and, and then pursued it. So. And now you're working at a nursery. Can you explain a little bit about what the nursery is here at the Park District? Yeah, I think our nursery is kind of unique, isn't it? Very. I think so, yeah. Um, it's it's unique. We um, are a reforestation or a for, forest nursery. We grow native species. We collect all of our own seed. Our propagator collects, well, 99.9% of all of the the stock that we use for reforestation comes from our own seed stock that are collected from specimens that our propagator seeks out to try to that determine that are native to not only Minnesota, but this specific region, you know, that have evolved with um, this very specific ecosystem. So I would imagine with us propagating trees, planting them for reforestation, there are some big obstacles to overcome for the success. A lot of work and time is going into these. So what are some of those obstacles, hint, hint, we're yeah. getting towards? Yes. Deer <laughs> is an obstacle. I think... Um, there's a lot of different uh, opinions about this, but deer, depending on the site, are definitely an obstacle. So in order to, to um, sort of reduce the deer pressure, we um, we have a couple different ways of doing that. Um, kind of the most common in the way that a lot of other agencies around the country do is with fences. Mm-hmm. Um, we plant about 50,000 seedlings a year, um, and a lot of those are within deer exclosure fences. And those have to meet certain specifications. Um, right. We've had different, we've tried different methods. Um, Electri- so, like electric, like electric fences. fences. Yep. Which we found don't really ex- exclude deer very well. So we've now moved to an eight foot uh, woven wire fence, which also are not 100% effective at excluding deer, but they re- really do reduce the pressure. They do allow other herbivores, rabbits and rodents, meadow voles. So um, we still have pressure from other mammals. Browse, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And deer, I would imagine, have you, I mean, have you witnessed deer browse damage yourself out in the field or within some of our, because refor- not all of our sites will use the fencing. Right. There's a cost associated with fencing and we can't always afford to fence every planting site that we do. Um, so yeah, those areas where we haven't fenced, it's been mixed. Some areas will have, have a huge deer damage and others not, and it's sort of a roll of the dice. But as you, as Stephen can probably speak to, all of our parks, the where we do reforestation is within the Three Rivers Park District in sort of the Hennepin County and Metro area. There's a, a huge deer pressure compared to maybe even outstate Minnesota. So, um, so that's a, yeah, it is it is one of the factors we consider. But not only you know deer pressure, but other herbivores. I mean, there's climactic stresses, um, soil degradation, development, all sorts of other things. You know, deer aren't. The, the only, only obstacle, not by by no means. Yeah. Right. So it kind of comes out what we've talked about in the past again, where it's all these different stresses together, and they just kind of pile up together. But reducing as many of the stresses as we can helps them be yes. more successful. Exactly. So you know, if you can keep deer out of some areas, it reduces that stress. They can be more successful. If you can help with the soil degradation in another area, it reduces that stress. They can be more successful. It's it's kind of trying to reduce as many stresses as we can. Yep. It's not easy to recreate an old growth big woods or old growth forest. So. Um, yeah, we want to give every give ourselves every benefit or opportunity to help these forests be successful and grow into a self-sustaining ecosystem. And I know there's been one thing, too, where deer away, and people will use this in their gardens. I've smelt it firsthand and sprayed trees. Deer repellent. Yeah. yeah. We used to use that in the forestry department. We've gone away from it because it's very unpleasant. It smells like a predator or, a, you know, a musk. That's, or That's one word for it. <laughs> Rotten yeah, eggs, a right. diaper with burnt hair yes. in it. I don't know. It's ones terrible. That, yeah, or that smell like coyote urine or different types of things. They're all very unpleasant, and they don't work that well on the larger scale. I think if you planted four trees in your backyard and you were diligent about applicating or applying it uh, after every rainfall and, and frequently, you might have success. But when we're doing 10, 20, 30, 40-acre sites um, and all over the park district, the logistics of getting back and reapplying, it just doesn't seem to be worth mm-hmm. the hassle and the discomfort, the uncomfort, you know, the unpleasant. Yeah, who's the poor seasonal that gets to go do that, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> me. So, it was me. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, so do you are just one of the many stresses that you face of trying to reforest? I know they put a stress on our wildflowers as well because they like to eat them. Um, so I imagine then that you rely on wildlife a lot to help reduce some of that stress too because yes. fences can only take you so far. And so having a... Uh, uh, population within it, the carrying capacity of the park probably helps out a lot with reducing 
reducing that stress. So Steve, can you talk a little bit about how wildlife does that work, making sure that our deer don't exceed the carrying capacity, the number of deer that our parks can healthily sustain? Yeah, I can definitely talk on this topic. This is probably one of my favorite topics to talk on. <laughs> um, I mean, folks, he I, we can barely see him in the studio because he is wearing camo today. <laughs> well, he he to came dressed for, for the podcast. <laughs> yep. yeah. One thing I wanted to mention quick is talking about the deer fences, we, we talked about how it doesn't keep all the deer out. Um, and one thing I just wanted to mention is sometimes we get calls from the public and saying, oh my gosh, there's a deer in the fence. And our response is always, well, if it, it can get in there, it can get out. And so like you talked about, keeping the majority of the deer out is the goal. And, mm-hmm. and, and that's what's allowing those trees to be able to um, you know, grow to be the size. Yeah, that one or two deer getting the in there over the summer uh, is not nearly the effect as if the herd had free reign to come and go and browse at will. So it still is... Um, the fences, even though they're not 100% effective, they do reduce the pressure. The yep. trees are, right. they evolved with the deer so they can handle a little bit of browsing. Right. It's when you have way too many deer browsing yes. that it becomes a, an issue. It's kind of like me going to an all-you-can-eat buffet is going to be fine, <laughs> but you get a whole football team going there. <laughs> yeah. There might not be a lot of food left at that's the right. end. Yeah. So what is our carrying capacity or what does that yeah. mean? Yeah, that's a good question. So what we try to do is keep the deer populations at or probably around, you know, the suggested level from the Minnesota DNR, 20 to 25 deer per square mile. That's typically what the DNR suggests the deer population should be at. Um, so this is something that we work on, you know, probably 20% of wildlife's, you know, position or job is to control deer and work on deer management. Um, it is the most pursued game animal in Minnesota. And so it is something that does have a very polarized um, topic behind that. <laughs> um, but it, it's so there just simply is just too many deer, as you guys spoke on before. And we know that from the aerial deer surveys that we do. And what um, are aerial deer surveys? Yeah, so aerial deer surveys are where um, wildlife staff will go up into helicopters, and we do that during the winter. Um, we need enough snowfall, typically 8 to 12 inches of snow is what we're looking for. And, and why the snow? Us, yeah, so you need that just because obviously you've got the leaf off in the wintertime, and then the snow just gives you that nice white background and allows you to see brown deer. deer are, so, yeah, they yeah. change their coat color for the winter to really match the drab brown color. <laughs> yep, that's right. So if you get up in the air, then you're looking down on that the much, snow cover. How much so, do you love that? I love it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great part <laughs> of my job. When park Absolutely. staff goes up in the helicopter, you're talking <laughs> he about you. Him. Yeah, yep. I, go, I do the majority of the flying. You know, there are other wildlife staff that do I it as well. I attempted but. this. Stephen brought me up uh, a year ago or so to, to try it out. I get car sick, folks, like mm-hmm. really easily. So... No bueno for me. I will not be doing deer surveys <laughs> into the future. So it's all yours, Stephen. Yeah, that's right. So with the uh, helicopter, then you get an idea of how many deer are in each of our parks. Right. Um, and then what what do you do with that information? Yeah, so we have a very long history of doing aerial deer surveys. And actually, the first one was done back in the 1970s um, around Carver Park Reserve. Uh, I think it was 19... 19- 75, they counted like 80 deer within Carver Park. Um, And then later on in 1978, um, is actually that population had grown to like about 150 some deer. And then that's actually when the first shotgun hunt was held um, at Carver. And that was uh, during that time. So So shotgun hunt, that's something the park... Yep, so that's a part of what we also do within deer management. So um, we've got our aerial deer surveys. You know, that's typically during the wintertime. Um, that's the majority of my time, January, February, is doing that. And um, that's working in flying all of our parks. We also fly all the different agencies in and around our parks as well. And that's in um, kind of a partnership to also so. know the deer that are coming in and out of the parks. Yes, it gives us, you know, it helps us um, to understand what the population is not only in the park, but then surrounding the park as well. So you get a good big picture. And then it helps the, the cities managers as well to kind of know that and it really helps with the coordination part of that for um, the whole metro area for the whole metro area um so we do that part of it we also hold hunts um we do that with both archery and shotgun um with our archery hunts they're all metro bow hunters resource base that we partner with mbrb mbrb yep in short and so we use them um to to hold those and to help uh um kind of organize the hunters from that respect for us for for our archery hunts after that, you know, staff time involved our, our shotgun hunts. That's something that we have to actually staff for our check stations. Because we close the parks We close the park down. completely down. We check in every hunter, check out every hunter, check in every single deer. Um, and so that's what we're doing at that And site. what information are we getting when we're checking those deer in and out? Yeah, so uh, we're getting a lot of different information. Uh, we do take the weights of all of the deer, um, which would be kind of interesting to look at the very long term. You know, what, what have, the, have the weights changed? You know, that's yeah. something we haven't really discussed or looked at. Um, but we also age all the deer. 
what and you, how do you age a deer? Yeah. I know the answer to this. I yeah. love it. So this is this is um, something that I uh, typically you take a knife. Uh, you have to actually cut back um, um, on the jawline, and then that way you can actually get a good picture of the lower jaw on the teeth. And from there, you can actually look at the. Um, it's the third premolar. Milk tooth. The milk tooth, yep. And so you're looking at that tooth, whether or not it's a baby tooth or not. And then that would Because they lose you, it. They lose that, yep. So they would lose that at after a year and a half. And you'll always talk about half a year mm-hmm. at hunting, you know, because it's half a year from when they were born in the spring. Mm-hmm. So all deer aging in, in during the hunts is in half a year. Um, so then that if it's lost, then it's two and a half years. After that, then you're looking at the wear and tear on the teeth and looking at, you know, whether or not it's... Uh, up to seven and a half year, years typically is what we've seen. And mm-hmm. that's just from, you know, how worn out the teeth are. So from their eating. So we do that. Um, there's a lot of signage parts that we do for all of our hunts, whether it's archery or shotgun. Um, and that's kind of what we, we spend the majority of our time doing. So so if I'm a hunter and I want to get involved in a shotgun mm-hmm. hunt at like Elm Creek Park Reserve or Carver Park Reserve, yeah. uh, do I contact you guys? No. So for the shotgun hunts, that's all done through the Minnesota DNR for the same, like any other part, like hunt you would do, special permit hunt that you would like do in a state, the state park or yep, a state park hunt, um, whether it's like even applying for a doe license in, in your area. So everybody in the state has one priority or has a priority points that they can build and they can use those priority points um, for anything. And one of those park hunts that they could put that towards would be our shotgun hunt. And we do get a lot of interest for that because it is typically the second weekend of the shotgun hunt. So a lot of you know, people that do the opener, you know, family tradition up north, um, they're typically back by that time. And it is a hunt that um, is in the metro area where the majority of the people in Minnesota live. Um, and it's something that we, you know, really shut down the park. And, and it's actually unlimited deer that people can take um, within the metro area because it's zone 601. And so what limits the deer take in, that, in this area is just the ability to go hunting. And so by opening up the park hunt for two days, you know, we, we get a lot of interest in our park hunts for that. So. In- do you pr- like? Do you try to encourage people to take more does or more bucks? Yeah. So all of our hunts. That's another part of what we do is orientations. And so at the orientation, we're really talking to these hunters and saying, you know, we this these hunts are for management. You know, we're not holding these park hunts for recreation purposes. The fact that they're recreating is great. That's a wonderful, you know, part of it. Um, but really, we're doing this because there simply just is too many deer. And so this is what allows, um, or we're talking to the hunters and saying, you know, really, we want those antlerless deer taken out of the parks because those are your breeding populations. Now, we haven't really touched on this a lot. Um, we've talked about like crop damage or tree damage, especially, but there's other issues with overpopulation of deer that I'm sure we have to somewhat deal with too, which is we're in an urban area. So road collisions is another big thing that I don't think we've uh, touched on quite enough because that is a really big deal in this neck of the woods a lot i can't remember it's like i think minnesota's ranked seventh for the most deer collisions in um, the u.s yeah that's something we've really started looking at recently um probably the last four years we've actually gotten data from both the state and the county for the the number of deer number of reports they've had of deer collisions and this comes from um um, we kind of have to get it from two separate places county road and then state road and we end up, from the last four years, it averages right around 400 deer that um, are actually reported hit um, in Hennepin County itself. So that's something that is, it's, it, you, that doesn't count the number of deer that got bumped and then the deer went running off and the driver, you know, drove away. So there's probably quite a few more, but the actual mm-hmm. records that we have, it seems to be right around 400 deer each year in Hennepin County alone. Yeah, and it sounds like that number's kind of been staying steady that there hasn't been too many influxes of deer collisions? Uh, I would say from what we've seen from the last three to four years, it's been right around that 400. That hasn't really changed too much that we've seen. We haven't really gone back and looked, you know, previously, um, you know, since 2015 data probably. So this was for, I believe, 2011 to 2012. It was an estimated 1.23 million deer vehicle collisions occurred in the U.S., costing more than $4 billion in vehicle damage. According, this was from State Farm. Deers are the deadliest animal in the United States. Just for that factor? Just imagine. because of that, because of the car. Like, you know, everybody worries about a bear or a wolf is going to get him or a mountain lion. It's the deer that's going to get you. Well, I you. would imagine, like, your chances of getting, like, in a bear attack are pretty high. For a deer, it's like 1 in 77 is what I read will be in a deer collision. Yep, yeah, and, like, you know, I, I can't remember the last time somebody was attacked by a wolf in the lower 48. It's... 
been decades, if not a, a century, really. So it's uh, we worry about that because like, oh, it's this part of there, but it's the deer collisions that really have a huge impact on people. And that probably is really the limiting, you know, population level wise within Hennepin County. I mean, if you t- think about all of our park hunts within our our hunts alone, we took 211 deer, I think, in 2018 for with all of our park hunts, archery hunts and shotgun hunts. You know, and then you had 400 some that were hit by cars. By cars, yeah. yeah. But that's not the main reason, though, that we do our, our deer management. Mm-hmm. You know, the main reason is the vegetation side of it that we talked about. But that's definitely, this is a piece of it, for sure. So I, I guess then for both of you, how do you think the parks would be different if we weren't doing this park ma- or this deer management? Population level wise? Uh, I, I think like in terms of impacts on our parks, like would they look different than they do now? Would they be about the same if we didn't do deer management? Would it like, I guess. Um... Yeah. What if we just did nothing? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. We would have a ton of deer within our parks. Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, we we encourage our hunters through all of our orientations to take those antlerless deer. And if you think about that, you know, if you take a buck, you know, five years later, you've only ever taken that buck. You take a doe, you know, I think five years later with the offspring you know, and then the offspring of those offspring, you know, it adds up to like something like 36 deer in mm-hmm. five years. So, I mean, taking that one antlerless deer really does make a difference in the population. The females. The Shooting females. the females makes a the much females. big, yes. yeah, that's yeah. my understanding. Yeah. So, Sean, I know we... The forest would look drastically different too with with increased deer pressure. It becomes almost, you know, pasture land for them in our age classes. We really look for regeneration, um, seedlings and, you know, an old growth forest to have younger trees coming up and that's where the deer browse so i don't even imagine we've talked a little bit about invasive species in some of our other podcasts but it seems like deer don't prefer some of these invasives and that they prefer the natives right and so yeah do the math leaving the invasives alone but chewing and targeting the the oaks and the things that are really valuable to us for native species and the ecosystems if you don't have native species in that understory there's no competition for buckthorn and other invasives. So you've just got the old growth sugar maple basswood and then invasive layer. It's teetering and, that and, scale yeah, mm-hmm. in one direction in the favor of the invasives. Right. So do you feel like you could successfully manage our forest without deer control? Not as successfully as we can with deer control. I guess okay. it's a hard to answer, but uh, it would it would be a much be a lot more challenge. fences. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which are very, very expensive. Right. And just maintenance. I mean, you have to mow around them. You have to, if trees fall down, things like that. And we've had fences removed. So these are temporary fences. Right. But again, I, as Stephen and I can both look at each other and we do prairies, which is more of like a three, five year thing. But the work you guys are doing within forestry is very long term. I mean, yes. you guys aren't going to ever sit in the shade of those trees within your your work career here at the park. Unlikely, right. When we plant seedlings, you know, I might be able to grow that seedling to 20 feet tall in the nursery in 12 to 15 years, but in the wild, it might take 20, 30, 40 years to get even above deer browse height, depending on the conditions. It's a lot more challenging. It takes a lot longer for those reforestation plantings to mature. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so deer, deer management is definitely a big tool in the toolbox when it comes to forest management. Absolutely. That's a big piece of it. Do you feel like we're pretty successful with the goals you have laid out for deer management? Yeah, we've we've really documented that data and looked and pretty much all of our parks are right around that 20 to 25 deer per square mile right now. Um, and so with, you know, the, the controlled hunts that we're doing, you know, we're, we keep doing them and we keep maintaining that population in around that 20 to 25 deer. You know, over the years, we've had it up, you know, quite high. You know, we've had it lower in some cases, but you know, right now we are kind of sitting where we should be using the hunts that we're doing. Being part of a park district in a a kind of a metro area, we can't do everything by ourselves because our neighbors, our listeners have a huge impact on what comes into our parks. Is there anything that our, our listeners can do to help with high deer populations around our parks? I think the big piece of that is get involved. I mean, if you are, um, you know, in a city and you're seeing deer and they're eating your hostas and eating your tomato plants and, you know, you're, you're noticing, you know, whatever damage being done, um, you know, contact, you know, your cities or contact your, the government agencies that you live in and get involved. You know, there's little things that you can do on your own. You can do your own little fencing, you know, fencing around gardens, you know, over top of tomato plants, keep things on your deck, um, you know, use the deer away. Deer repellents. Deer repellents. Yep. I mean, that's something that has to be, you know, you, you can use on a small scale Mm -hmm. a lot more easily and you're able to, you know, use it each time after it rains or whatever you have to do with that part of it. But I think the big part of it is if you do want to see deer control and deer management is to get involved with governments. When you live in an area that has a high deer population, I know, so I mentioned seedlings, they're 12 inches tall, right at a perfect height for deer, but we also plant over 10,000 
um, larger saplings. Um, and the whole idea behind that is to plant trees that are already above the height of the deer browse, five feet or more. Um, so as a homeowner, um, yeah, it costs a little bit more, but if you plant those older age class or sapling a larger size, the deer might, you know, chew the buds off the lower, but but if it gets above the deer browse height, then... It's still going to be a healthy it's tree. It's got a leg live. up, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I know I've got, I've planted like some oak seedlings and they were smaller, so then I did a cage. Yep. Just to make sure it ensured. There's no other way. And yeah. then you have to kind of, you're going to have to check it and change that cage as needed as the tree grows. But oaks grow very, very slow. So mm-hmm. let your, your family know so that they can continue caring for that tree. Yep. All right. Well, thank you both so much for taking time today. Um, it was great to have this balance of both wildlife and forestry working together. And next, we are going to talk to Bill Volbrecht and Ryan Barth, both involved with park hunts here at Three Rivers. Did you know we host a youth hunt? So we also encourage the future generations to participate and be environmental stewardships by being connected with this balance and keeping it. So I hope you join us and tune in for our next episode. In the meantime, if you have questions or comments for us, if you have ideas for topics you want us to talk about, uh, you can go ahead and email us at wanderingnaturalist at threeriversparks.org.